Now, in the book of Galatians, Paul says things like this. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? I, and that was in verse three, in verse uh, chapter three, in chapter one, he said, "I'm amazed that you so quickly b- removed yourself from the grace I taught you, on uh, uh, the gospel, onto another gospel which is not a gospel." So he had some criticism for them. This church here, he sees something in them, and so we're going to talk about what that something is that Paul sees in them. Now, this week's lesson, How to Get in Paul's Everyday Prayer List, that was my original title. I should have changed that when I changed the title up above. Uh, How to Get in Paul's Everyday Prayer List, I now entitled How First Century Christians Got in Paul's Everyday Prayer List because Paul's not praying for me. As far as I know, I don't know if saints in heaven pray for us or not, but as far as I know, he's not praying for me. But... um, we can learn what impressed Paul about certain believers that made him always want to pray for them. Always. All right? So, Father, help us with this, I pray, so we can see this. I know I already prayed. This is just kind of an open-eye prayer. Verse 1. We're going to do nine verses. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, Timotheus, by any other name, is Timothy. Timothy is someone that sometimes traveled with Paul. Paul seen Timothy as his spiritual son, even though Paul was not the one who led him to Christ. But he was kind of the one that just poured doctrine into Timothy. And he loved Timothy. Because he was a man of God, and men of God love people. But he had a special place in his heart for Timothy, and he even includes Timothy on the beginning of this letter. So he said that it's me and Timothy writing to you, in essence is what he's saying. Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ, he teaches, and a spiritual brother of his and the Colossians was Timothy. So that's who's doing the writing. It's going to be mostly Paul's doctrine. I wouldn't be surprised if Paul, as the the great teacher he was, had Timothy put some input in there, which is helping Timothy. And uh, so Timothy maybe put some thoughts in there as well. Whichever thought a particular verse is, whether it's Paul or Timothy, the main point is it's uh, divinely inspired. It's the Holy Spirit that caused Paul to word these things the way he did. So he said in verse 2, To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Coloth. That's the name of the city where the church of the Colossians was. Uh, the actual city name was Coloth. And so he said, I'm writing to you at, who are Christians in that city. And then he said what he says at almost the beginning of every one of his epistles. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then this is where it starts. He said, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ praying always for you. Praying always for you. Now, Vincent, who is um, one of the commentaries in my Bible, who's not a re- it's not a regular commentary. You know, I've written on uh, commentaries on four epistles. But that's not the kind of commentary Vincent and Robertson write. These are two guys who write commentaries to point out what certain of the Greek words mean which can put a new appearance to the verse and uh, as he's looking at the Greek structure the original Greek structure of this verse Vincent has this to say about praying always rather connect always with we give thanks and render we give thanks for you always in other words 
Vincent is saying in his mind, in the Greek, the always isn't the praying, it's the giving thanks for the folks. And so I made a comment about that right under Vincent's notes, because I'm not going to argue with Vincent. He knows a lot more about the Greek than I do. I made a comment, perhaps according to Vincent, verse 3 should have been, or should have affixed always to give to giving thanks instead of affixing it to praying. However, verse 9, the last verse we'll get to on the other side. Uh, verse 9, what says, know that they, that they also prayed always, that is, without ceasing for the Colossian believers. So rather, the always belongs there to the praying. Uh, certainly, just let me flip it over for a moment and read verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. So, if you're not ceasing to pray for someone, that means you're always praying for them. So, um, whether uh, Vincent is right in verse 3 or not, the main point Paul's getting across is there's something in you that I like. And because I like that something in you, there's a whole lot of my prayers going up to heaven on your behalf. A whole lot of prayers. What does without ceasing mean? One verse in First Thessalonians tells me to pray without ceasing. I can't do that. Can't pray without ceasing. I got to stop to say hi to Daryl. To tell Artie so beautiful. To ask my wife, what do you want me to do next? <laughs> we can't pray constantly. So what's it mean? Never give up the habit of prayer. Always have a habit of prayer. It doesn't have to be traditional prayer. You don't have to be at a church altar. I talk to God when I'm driving my car all the time. All the time. Maybe that's why I say and God, please, look out! But no. You, you better pray maybe, maybe I'm talking to God too much. I don't know. <laughs> but, but I do talk to God while I'm uh, driving. Uh, I talk to Him uh, in the house a lot. Maybe I'm watching the news on TV. Then I'm really talking to God. I said, oh, God, help America. Uh, so, a lot of times we talk to God. So, the idea is, Never quit the habit of prayer. Talk to God. So when he says we're praying without ceasing, Paul had other things to do. He couldn't stay on his knees 24-7 and pray for them. But he's saying that I never quit praying for you. I prayed for you yesterday. I'm praying for you today. I'll pray for you tomorrow. I'm going to keep this habit up of praying for you is what he's saying. Now verse 4. Why is Paul wanting to always pray for them? Let me read verse 4. Again, verse 3 first. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, verse 4, since we heard that you're really struggling in the Christian faith and that you have trouble even liking each other. That's not what it says, is it? Those people would need prayer, but that's not what it says. He said, the reason I'm praying for you is because we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints. I tell people all the time, you want to know uh, outside of Jesus and God and uh, the words referring to the deity, you want to know the most in, two important words in the Christian faith in the New Testament, faith and love. You get those two things right, and you're getting a lot right. Faith in God, love for His people. First John, we just finished going through that. He emphasized the second part of that over and over and over and over again, that we've got to love each other. So he said, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love which you have to all the saints. So he's saying, that's when I got that message... That's when I put you at the top of my prayer list, right there. I'm going to pray for you all the time. Who's usually at the top of our prayer list? The guy dying of cancer in the hospital. The guy who can't get over addiction. 
nothing wrong those people need prayer I'm not minimizing their need of prayer that's not the point of this lesson the point is the only people we ever think to pray for are those who are going through something sickness, discouragement, divorce, whatever and we're praying for them they weren't the one on the top of Paul's list I'm sure they were on his list somewhere but not at the top of it on the top of his prayer list was the mature believer the one who was firmly grounded in the word of God and as a result of being firmly grounded in the word of God they had faith in God and they loved each other now why would he pray for that bunch they're doing okay right doesn't it seem to you they're doing okay well let's read on here in a minute but before we get to that First uh, John three eighteen to twenty three. We just finished the epistle First John, and that was uh, probably in the latter forty percent of the letter. But th- this is what John wrote in chapter three, verses eighteen to twenty three. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before Him. In other words, if your word, is, if your love is genuine. So where it's more than just words coming out of your mouth, but it's actions coming forth from you. Hereby we uh, know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Now what's important about this? For if a heart condemneth, God is greater than a heart knows all things. And I can never read that verse without telling you what it means. If a heart condemneth, the word condemn, catagenostic, means if our heart knows something against us and you ever figure out that every time you do something wrong your heart knows something against you and then you go to prayer well if it's praying God forgive me that's not an issue but if you're praying for something else and your heart knows there's an area that it has something against you you can't pray in faith So if your heart condemns you, if it knows something against you, God knows all things. That's not a compound word. That just means He knows it. I, I can't stress this enough. Sometimes your heart will know something against you. God just knows it. He doesn't know it against you. There's no keta, the Greek prefix. There's no keta in that one. Just genosco. God knows everything about me. But because of the amazing miracle of Calvary, the amazing benefit of having Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, always interceding for me, God knows everything about me, but He knows nothing against me. Is that good news or what? That's good news. So, He said, because that, if our heart condemneth not, we have confidence toward God. Here's the good news of it. This is why it's so important to Paul. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him. You could almost make the argument, when I pray for something that's according to God's will and don't get it, it's because I'm letting my heart beat me up with what it knows about me. I'm not allowing the truth of the Scripture to get into the second part of that verse my heart knows it against me God just knows it doesn't know it against me if I can live in the second part God knows all things no kata k-a-t-a no prefix meaning against he knows it but unlike my heart he doesn't know it against me there is nobody in this room that doesn't have mental times of beating yourself up because your heart knows something against you and because your heart knows something against you it tells you you're not worthy to expect God to answer your prayers the heart's right I'm not worthy 
That's not what this is about, my worth. It's about His grace. And His having totally forgiven me. So, I'm not going to spend any more time there because I want to get through this stuff. But my point is, the reason Paul wants you to get this stuff, Paul wants you Christians to have absolute faith in God and love for His people. Why? Because then, if you're walking in those two realities, I trust you, Lord, totally, I trust you. And you love one another, even though we make it difficult. Now there is spiritual potential in you that the Christian who's up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, doesn't have and will never have until he gets up and stays there once in a while. That potential is to get your prayers answered. And what are we to pray? The will of God. John taught us in chapter 15 that God is utilizing us to get His will done on earth by laying on us the burdens of His desires so we pray God doesn't need my prayers to do anything then why does he do that to include me he wants to include me in the doing of his will on earth so he says you pray for my will and we're going to do it so there's so many reasons why we need to get this and why Paul was praying daily for the spiritually healthiest group there. The strong ones. Again, I want to go on record as saying, you need to pray for the sick, you need to pray for the struggling, you need to pray for the weak, you need to pray for all those people that are on every church's prayer list. The problem isn't that we shouldn't pray for them. The problem is we're so busy praying for them, we're not praying for the people with the most spiritual potential which are those who have faith in God and love God's children. And them are the ones that Paul prayed for all the time because he's seen some possibility there. I'm not a good salesperson. When I was a realtor, you know, you had classes and you had all this. Uh, and they're trying to teach you to be better at this or better than that at that. If some of that stuff could have sank in, besides preaching, I'd still be selling real estate. But I'm not real good at approaching people and trying to get them to buy something. That's why uh, um, I've never got... I tried to get into one or two of these, what they call these pyramid companies, um, multi, multi, multi-level marketing. Yeah, I tried a couple of them... And I couldn't succeed at it. You know why? They teach you. Start with your family. Tell everybody in your family. Then tell your extended family. Then tell your neighbors. And I thought, you know, when I go over to drink coffee at Daryl's, um, I guess I haven't done that yet. But if I were to go over and drink coffee at Daryl's, he'd rather I just drink coffee with him than try to sell him something. And so uh, I've never been real good at that. Kevin... He'll tell anybody, anywhere, anytime about Jesus and how they need to get their lives straight. I look for an opening. Kevin makes an opening. He's a salesman. He's a car salesman. Uh, He's used to broaching the gap. He brings it up. I have my ears open looking for you to say something that gives me an opportunity. Kevin makes an opportunity. That's how everybody is different. Um, But nonetheless, my point is, in this particular part of the lesson, Paul sees some potential. Now why, what made these people so spiritually mature? What made them so spiritually mature? He tells us in verse 5, after verse 4 says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. You know, when I was looking that over this morning, you know what I thought about? You know what Paul didn't have? One of these. 
And even if Paul had, had one of these, it wouldn't have done them any good because nobody else had one of these. When my brother died, my sister could pick up the phone and call me. I knew right now. For Paul to have heard how well these Christians were grounded in Coloss, nobody picked up the phone and told him. Somebody had to be sent from the church, or he sent somebody in his group to the church to find out how they were doing, and then that same person had to make the long journey back. Half the church could have died by the time he got feedback. Took forever. These were long walks. So things were different. But then you realize no matter how long the time for him to get the message to the Colossian Christians and for then the message to get back that whoever he sent, suppose he sent Timothy, whoever he sent for Timothy to find out what's going on and make the long journey back to wherever Paul was, you're talking probably months. So we live in a different period. Uh, I knew the day my brother died. I knew. It's about a if you don't stop and eat and go to the bathroom it's probably an eight hour trip but I knew because it's not an eight hour trip with this so things were tougher then but the Holy Spirit had to direct them to write because everything could have changed in Coloss after the message from Paul got there and then the results of whoever Paul sent there got back to Paul everything could have changed there might have been all a bunch of backsliders but I'll say two things about that the Holy Spirit knows they weren't backsliders because he inspired this letter and number two knows they weren't backsliders because they were strong in the faith and their love for each other that, that crowd's going to keep serving God no matter what happens all right. So, verse 5. Why were they so, so strong? For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Let me read that same verse in a couple modern translations. Easy to read version. Your faith and love continue. How come? Because you know what is waiting for you in heaven. The hope you have had since you first heard the true message, the good news. Good News Bible. When the true message, the good news, first came to you, you heard about the offer it, I mean the hope it offers. So your faith and love are based on what you you hope for, which is kept safe for you in heaven. You know, um, I'm going to see if I, I might have a... Yeah, there it is. Look underneath there, 1 John 3, 2 and 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, right now. I'm a child of God right now. I will never be more of a child of God than I am right now. When Jason was born, he was a baby. Time goes on, now he's a bigger baby. <laughs> we grow, different things change. Now he's married to the second most beautiful woman on the planet. He might have a different opinion than me. I'm not sure. But, boy, I've put you in a hard place. Who do you think is prettier? <laughs> he just ignores it. Let me read this. Now, right now, you're a child of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we'll be like him, for we shall see him as he is. One of the most beautiful verses in the scripture. When will I reach the final stage of spiritual growth, that stage being my glorification, when I see Jesus as he is? That's when I'm not one moment before then. I'm already called, I'm already justified. I'm not yet glorified, nor will I be until I see him as he is. And so what does that say? Um, when he shall appear we shall be like him how come 
because then we're going to see him in his fullness of his glory. When we see him in his glory, we will be like him. So what does that mean to me on an everyday basis? Look at that verse 3. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he, God, is pure. If you get the hope of heaven in you, it'll make you live right. Now, I got this somewhere else in the notes, but I'm going to bring it out now in case I run out of time. You ever hear anyone tell you about someone, that person is so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. You ever hear that? Paul's going to dispute that. John's going to dispute that. He said being heavenly minded is what makes you fervent for the Lord. I would be a lot more beneficial to you if I'm more heavenly minded. Heavenly mindedness is what causes me to see all the things I used to struggle with as secondary. My focus isn't on quitting that I've just lost interest in it. Because I'm focused on what's coming. Now I'm sure there have been some kooks who always wanted to talk about heaven that didn't believe much about heaven. And that's probably what gave birth to that statement. But the truth is, the more heavenly minded you get, the more you're going to have faith in God and love His people. That's what this lesson is telling us. The more you're going to purify yourself if you have the hope of glorification. Anybody with this hope purifies themselves. In other words, they lay aside all the junk that holds them down. All right? So, Hebrews 11, 8 to 11. Verse 8, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place he should have to, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing not knowing whither he went. In other words, God said, Abraham, leave your father and follow me. Back in those days, you know how it worked? Some dad had eight sons, three girls. Those eight sons became his heirs. You say, well, that's unfair to the girls. No, they married somebody else's sons who had it. Uh, who were heirs. Of the eight sons, the firstborn, you divided the inheritance in twelve uh, in nine pieces because the firstborn got twice what the other seven got. He got a double portion. And then the other seven got a single portion of the nine portions. So the firstborn got twice what the others did. People didn't leave dad in those days. But that's exactly because their inheritance lie with their dad. That's exactly what God told Abraham to do. I want you to leave your dad's house and follow me. I'm going to take you places. And Abraham did that. He walked away from what in the natural was his retirement plan dad dying you work for dad till he dies and then your retirement plan your inheritance comes into place God said Abraham I want you to walk away from all that I want you to walk away from all that now don't get me wrong he must have done some things on the side because he had a whole bunch of livestock to take with him when he started his journey. And his nephew Lot wanted to go with him, and he had a big herd. So consequently, I don't know if their fathers agreed to turn some of it loose for them, give them an early, we don't get that information, uh, an early retirement or what. But nonetheless, Abraham was told to leave what most people never left. 
In our society today, the kids can't wait to grow up and get away from their parents. And look at Barb and me. Why would Jason and Angie ever want to get away from us? We're cute, huh, honey? So, but Abraham was told. So what did he do? Listen to what it said in verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with, uh, with him of the same promise. Now what's he saying there? Abraham spent time in the promised land. But when Abraham was in the promised land, it wasn't his land. It was land that was given to him, but not in the sense that Abraham ever owned a one piece of it. He was a sojourner there, a traveler. Over 400 years later, when his descendants left Egypt, and God sent them into the promised land, Abraham was long dead before the promised land that God promised him became the property of his descendants. So God said, I want you to do this. Not only are you leaving the certainty here, but you'll never own what I'm going to give you. And he did it. Put that page over, if you will. Verse 10. Why did Abraham do it? The same reason the Christians Paul wrote, uh, wrote to in Colossus had faith in God and loved each other because they had a vision of heaven. I don't mean an actual vision of heaven. They visualized what's before them. Why did Abraham do this? For he looked for a city which had foundation, whose builder and maker was God, is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. So, what's it telling us? Do you know there was no Bible when Abraham was around The first five books of the Bible were written by Moses, which is centuries after Abraham, at least four centuries, maybe longer, four and a half. I don't think it would be five, but somewhere in there. He had no Bible. Job was written before the first five books. We don't know, I don't know uh, what they predicted was, but the chances that whatever Job wrote was ever seen by Abraham are pretty slim. So Abraham has nothing but a voice in his ear. That's it. Can you imagine me going home and telling my wife, Honey, we're going to give everything we got away because God told me we need to go over here. I better have more proof than that. (laughs) than what I said. At, uh, could God do that? Absolutely he could. He can do whatever he want. But you know what I believe he'd do if he did do that? If he put a voice in my head and told me what to do the way he did Abraham? I believe he'd confirm it to her. I have no doubt about that at all. But my point is, Abraham, who never had a Bible, who never read about anything called heaven, somehow knew about this thing called heaven. Because the scripture said what gave him such steadfastness was he looked for a city which has foundations. What that mean? One that will never crumble, one that will never go away whose builder and maker is God, not some construction team. He was looking for a building, I mean, uh, he was looking for a city that wasn't built by anybody, and it wasn't here yet. But already, somehow, he knew about it. He knew about a heaven that hardly you ever read about in the Old Testament. 
There are some things that hint at it, but not much to give you a clear understanding. Before the Old Testament was written, this guy, somehow, I don't know how God convinced him, knew there was a special place after this life. And it gave him it gave him the face to follow God when he said, Leave your dad, come with me. Romans four eleven. God wasn't done with Abraham. He and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So Abraham, once uh, he was given the sign of circumcision, the Jewish people, all the males got circumcised. It started with Abraham. And then it went to Abraham's children and grandchildren, etc., etc. And the original promises of God were to the Jews the descendants of Abraham. But Paul's saying here, God called him before he was circumcised. Why? So he could be the father of the faith as well as the father of Israel. He is the father of all believers. That's why. And so he is somebody we can look to as our father as well. Abraham is the only guy who's ever lived that could be called both the father of the Jews and the father of the non-Jews. Physically, he's only the father of the Jews. But spiritually, he's the father of the faith, the Christian church. It all, uh, well, we don't have time to get into all the details there. Let's drop down. Um, Abraham believed in heaven, even though there's not a single verse of the Bible was written yet that I know of. When our hope is focused on everything else but heaven, our spiritual fruit dries up, just like the fruit of the fig tree Jesus cursed. Some say, here's what, some people are become so heavenly minded the no earthly good. I say when we become heavenly minded, we become a blessing to those around us. Verse 6, which has come on to you as it is in all the world and bring his forth fruit as it does also in you since the day uh, you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. So the gospel keeps bringing blessings is what the Good News Version said there. The good news of the gospel keeps giving you blessings. What was it that came unto them? The message of grace, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word gospel, by the way, means good news. The, when you tell someone the gospel, they can get mad at you. Because you're in essence telling them they're going to go to hell if they don't get saved. You say, how's that good news? The good news is they can get saved. There's no other way to get to heaven. So you're telling them good news, but they're mad at you because they're saying God takes everyone to heaven. Years and years ago, Reader's Digest did a poll. I mean, I was a teenager probably. How many, something about asking the readers if they thought they'd go to heaven. Uh, if they, they, in other words, did they think there was a line in the sand? You had to be on this side of being good to go to heaven. If you're on that side of being good, you go to hell. I forgot how they worded it, but that was it in an essence. You know what the majority of people felt? In that survey, they felt they were going to get into heaven barely, but most of their friends were going to hell. In other words, they thought they were a little bit better than their friends. The good news of the gospel is, I need to tell somebody they're a sinner so they know they need saved. Because if they don't know they need saved, they're not going to get saved. It's that simple. But you can offend people when you bring up the gospel because you're insinuating there's something wrong with them that will keep them out of heaven. Well, there was something wrong with me that would have kept me out of heaven. And every person who's ever been born. And that's something wrong with 
sin. And Jesus gave his life so that sin would not be a roadblock to heaven. Okay, verse 6. Which has come unto you as in all the world, this gospel message, he's saying, it brings forth fruit. Now verse 7. As you also learn to be papyrus, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Barnes has a note there. He thinks that that verse proves that Epaphras um, was um, a friend of Paul who was now the pastor of the Colossian church. Uh, whether or not that's true, uh, I'll leave it to those guys to discuss. Doesn't much matter to me. But in his opinion, uh, Epaphras did some teaching to the Colossian Christians, either as a guest teacher or as a pastor. And uh, he was teaching them. Uh, he, Paul said of this man, he's a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. So he's telling us an, another, maybe uh, all the information Paul got came from Epaphras. I don't know. Verse 9. For this cause also, since the day we heard it. The day we heard what? On this side. We heard of your faith in God and your love for one another. So he said, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So why is Paul telling us in closing that he prayed for them since the day he heard about their spiritual walk. He sees great potential in them. He sees great potential. That's why some, sometimes there's people that are so spiritually strong they're not doing much yet, but they're never on a prayer list. We're too busy praying for the guy dying of cancer. Nothing wrong with that. I defy you to bring me some church bulletin with prayer uh, prayer request in it that have any prayer request to pray for the strong Christian among you. I don't think you'll find that. They're going to tell you about all the people suffering in sickness, all the people having financial trouble, uh, all the people discouraged. They're going to tell you about everyone except the person the people that Paul prayed for because he's seen that eternity is impacted by people with spiritual potential and that crowd is those who have faith in God and love people